Welcome for this uh, second uh, session of uh, the UHSS uh, Spring uh, Talks. Um, so I am very glad to have switched the roles uh, with uh, Johan uh, Ockant to uh, introduce uh, him and uh, his uh, presentation uh, today. So Johan is an associate professor at the uh, UHSS. His uh, research focuses on the uh, organization and governance of uh, health and uh, social uh, welfare systems uh, in uh, Scandinavia. He also works on the political evolution of uh, democracy and uh, parties in uh, Scandinavian countries, of which he is a specialist. Uh, his uh, talk today will deal with the international comparison of uh, welfare and uh, health care uh, systems that have been uh, particularly uh, challenged uh, this uh, last month and uh, put to the test by the pandemic of uh, COVID-19. And so we are really eager to uh, see how Johan, through his uh, experience of the so-called Scandinavian models, will uh, uh, see the impact of uh, the pandemic over the health and welfare systems. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Edouard. Um, but actually, I'm not going to talk so much about uh, Scandinavia uh, today because uh, the, the main goal of this presentation uh, uh, here is to um, is to talk about um, give you give an overview of a, of a course that I've been uh, uh, giving uh, over the last uh, few years uh, here at the uh, which is an an introduction to comparative reforms of welfare systems. Uh, around the globe. Uh, so it's not really a research uh, seminar per se, as uh, most of the you know, teaching at UHSS are. It is uh, primarily designed for master students. Uh, and it's also important to uh, uh, show that we have this kind of, uh, of courses here uh, on offer at UHSS. So as um, and what I said, I can say a few words about my, myself. I uh, um, mostly specialize on the Nordic countries and Nordic welfare states, uh, welfare systems, uh, and uh, uh, social protection uh, reforms in these countries of uh, Denmark, uh, Sweden, Norway, a little bit uh, Iceland and, and Finland. But um, over the years, I've also moved. Uh, um, to other topics, or I've tried to enlarge my horizons and, uh, and uh, study comparative welfare uh, states, welfare systems, welfare reforms in other countries as well in Europe. And uh, at the start, of, uh, the motivation behind this, uh, this course was actually that there was not so much um, uh, worldwide comparison of uh, welfare uh, reforms. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, it, it could seem very ambitious to offer a course on such a broad topic uh, at the level of the entire world. And, uh, and it needs simplification. And, and uh, the, that's the challenge that I've undertaken. And the concentration is, of course, on a macro level with uh, regional country and case studies. Um, sometimes I can focus on a, healthcare reform in the US or uh, cash transfer programs in Latin America, pension reforms in Europe. I'm not a specialist of all that. It's, uh, it, I need to um, uh, study a lot of literature to, to, to try to do that, but I also count on the students here at OHSS who come from uh, very diverse horizons to uh, contribute to the class. And, uh, and this is a class that actually uh, uh, gives a lot of um, a focus to uh, uh, student uh, uh, presentations and group presentations uh, on specific uh, uh, topics. The next uh, um, challenge is to compare mature welfare states or welfare systems with uh, other uh, systems that can be considered emerging as, for example, the case of China, 
in countries that still provide very, very little by way of social spending or, or uh, social infrastructures. These countries are not always poor countries. It is also, as you know, a matter of spending priorities. Um, and uh, um, uh, historically, some relatively deprived uh, countries, such as, for example, in Latin America, Costa Rica, that used to be one of the poorest countries in the region, in the early 20th century, uh, started to develop uh, social programs um, as a kind of voluntary political uh, move. And other countries have done that. Uh, the, it's not always the, uh, the case that countries that were advanced uh, in the process of uh, industrialization uh, started to uh, move on to uh, uh, pass policies on, on, uh, on, on social programs. And uh, on the other hand, the richest countries are not always the more effective welfare providers, even when they apparently spend a lot. Um, and uh, we will talk about the, the US in, in, uh, and, and the fact that the US is, one of, is the biggest spender uh, on healthcare in the world. Uh, but uh, uh, at the same time, um, the effectiveness of this uh, spending can be, can be discussed very much. Um, so it is necessary to understand what is meant by, by spending here and the institutional, political, economic factors that are at play behind uh, the structuring or restructuring of welfare. Um, and, and, and also the fact that welfare spending is not reserved as we'd like it to be uh, to democratic uh, countries. Uh, although we, we, we think that democracies achieve higher well-being overall, one of the uh, process that we see is, for example, the de rapid development of, uh, of welfare spending in a country like, like China, that is still an authoritarian regime. Um, the neoliberal uh, era has been uh, regarded as uh, bad times for welfare, uh, general, generally. It's, it's been regarded uh, as a synonym for cutbacks, uh, in uh, uh, welfare provision and uh, um, uh, generosity. But the reality in, in the medium term is much more complicated. Uh, also, uh, I mean, because we have countries uh, such as China and others that in China represent 1.4 billion people, and they have invested considerably in social protection over the last 15 years, but other countries have done that as well. Um, neoliberal uh, globalization has, has certainly contributed to, to rising inequalities uh, between uh, people and countries, but also at the same time to increase social and healthcare spending in uh, many regions of the world. And uh, I mean, we can see that when we look at uh, the level of health spending um, in the period 2000 to 2017, in uh, different categories of, uh, of, uh, of countries. Uh, um, uh, and and the, the, the growth of, of health spending is actually uh, in all of these uh, um, uh, country groups. Uh, the growth is faster than, than the, the, the growth of, of GDP. Um, uh, it does not mean, of course, that the, the whole of this spending is going to uh, people who need it most. I mean, behind spending levels, we have all kinds of things. Of course, we have to uh, go into uh, uh, nuances and, uh, and it's, it's spending as such is not the only indicator that we should uh, uh, use here. Uh, another slide is the global health expenditure uh, distribution in 2018 and forecast for 2028. Uh, that's the global health uh, expenditure distribution. As you, as you can see, it's a massive representation of two countries, and especially one, the US accounts for 35% of uh, global uh, healthcare spending. That's just uh, huge. And it's forecast to, to be uh, f uh, more than 40%. Uh, uh, and that was before COVID struck so you can imagine uh, that these figures 
might uh, uh, even be higher than that. And China is just tailing behind. I mean, well, tailing, I mean, far behind, of course, but it's the second uh, largest spender uh, with a lot more inhabitants, of course, uh, but uh, um, uh, with, with, um, with um, uh, and, and uh, actually I, I, I took the wrong figure. The blue figure is, is 2018. And so uh, the, the proportion of the US is, is due to, uh, to, to slow down, but that was before COVID. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the Chinese uh, gross uh, uh, or the Chinese share is, is going, it was forecast to actually almost double by 2028. Uh, and behind where we see, I mean, the usual suspects uh, of uh, uh, Western or non-Western uh, wealth of states, but also um, Brazil somewhere uh, and, and India. Um, so uh, uh, there are other uh, countries than just uh, the, the traditional wealth of states that are represented uh, here. So it's important to bear in mind this kind of, of, um, of figure. And when we move on to the per capita health expenditure, or we could uh, focus on other kinds of expenditures than just health, but, but here for the sake of clarity, I'm using this one. And, and here we see that uh, I mean, the US, Switzerland, Norway are three dominant uh, spenders per capita. And Norway is um, also quite higher than the rest of the uh, uh, the European countries, and we can go back to that if you're interested to to know why. But it, of course, has to do with the very, very uh, uh, fast uh, um, growth of uh, of GDP in Norway because of oil, oil and gas resources over the last uh, 20, 30 years. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, be, if we um, uh, want to include China, China is just behind Canada. And is uh, about uh, uh, at the level of four uh, four thousand dollars per per capita. Uh, so uh, China would uh, inc would integrate this uh, this ranking very very short. Um, so this course is about reforms, um, um, mostly institutional and political reforms of the struggle to achieve uh, better coverage and protection of uh, uh, the population and the actors involved in this process. So it's very, very wide ranging. The, the tendency has been to accentuate the, the negative sense of reform, especially in, in the, the neoliberal uh, era, in, in the sense of cuts, uh, decreasing generosity. Uh, and one of the goals of this course was actually to, to uh, um, recall uh, that uh, social reforms had a very different meaning in the, in the beginning, uh, like a century ago. And social reforms were mostly associated with late 19th and, 20, and early 20th uh, century mobilizations and, and policies to achieve uh, better working and living conditions, uh, the construction of insurance uh, schemes, the, the improvement of social rights to reduce vulnerability. Um, and it's possible to show that even uh, during the neoliberal uh, uh, era, uh, social spending and healthcare spending have increased, as we've uh, shown. Uh, but that um, progressive reforms have seen the light. And uh, uh, we could mention uh, the reform of uh, an, uh, the, the ambitious reform of universal uh, towards universal healthcare. Uh, coverage in, in China that has taken place in the 2000s. So we can mention also the Affordable Care Act reform that Barack Obama and Joe Biden, by the way, um, uh, put forward in 2009, 2010. Um, this is, um, if we stop for a, a little moment on, on this one, uh, it, it meant and uh, it led to an uh, unprecedented increase of people uh, covered by social, uh, by healthcare insurance in, uh, in, in the US. Uh, here you have on this uh, diagram, the evolution uh, between 2008 and 2018 of the uh, number of, of uninsured uh, people uh, in the US. As, as you can see, we've seen a, a considerable drop uh, in, uh, in the number of in, uninsured people 
uh, thanks to this uh, reform um, uh, after 2010. I mean, it was slow in the beginning also because um, as you may know or not, um, it was a very, very controversial reform and it still is. Uh, it's been uh, uh, um, heavily uh, fought by, by Republican, uh, uh, by the Republican party and by Republican uh, governors in, in, in different states. Um, if, you, if you want more precision about the way the US uh, uh, system of uh, health insurance is, is organized, you have a majority of private insurance um, and, and you have uh, two uh, schemes for people over 65, uh, this is Medicare, and people who are under a certain amount of uh, income, this is Medicaid, uh, and these two programs were implemented in the 1960s under the Johnson administration. And uh, they were part of, uh, of uh, an effort to compensate for the lack of uh, universal healthcare uh, insurance in the US. There was another attempt to try to promote uh, this kind of universal healthcare in the 1990s under Clinton and uh, the Clinton administration, and they failed. They managed to um, improve the coverage of, uh, of children, um, but, uh, but not to develop a program for uh, the entire population. And so it's been a, a, a field of, uh, of conflict, uh, and uh, there are huge embedded interests, private interests, uh, um, one of the goal of the Obama uh, reform in the beginning was uh, to try to promote a public option for, uh, for, for uh, people to get insurance. And they did not manage to do that. They had to compromise uh, and they had to basically uh, uh, organize a system of regulation of private actors whereby uh, private insurance would uh, provide affordable uh, uh, plans. And, um, and the other uh, very important um, uh, uh, parts of the reform was to actually improve the coverage uh, through uh, Medi uh, Medicaid. Uh, but in spite of the, all the subventions, all the, the help that the federal government was giving to the state, because Medicaid is basically organized in the states, uh, you had a lot of opposition of uh, different states that did not even want to hear about the, the subsidies. And they did not want to improve Medicaid at, at all. Uh, you also had um, uh, states that uh, uh, tried to prevent by, by uh, uh, political campaigns, ads, and uh, all kinds of propaganda, uh, the, 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 the um, development of, uh, of the new uh, insurance uh, market on their territory. So it was, uh, and it is still, uh, a very, very, very uh, controversial uh, reform. And un under Donald Trump, uh, uh, Trump also tried to, um, uh, to um, uh, fragilize this, uh, this, this uh, reform. Uh, of course, then COVID came and now healthcare is at the, is at the center of attention. Uh, and, that, uh, and Biden, who was one of the promoters of uh, this reform uh, as vice president of uh, Barack Obama, is, is now president, so the context has changed uh, completely. The Democrats have uh, achieved a majority in Congress, and so we'll see what will happen, but it is likely to move in uh, the direction that was uh, initially promoted by, by uh, Obama. And, uh, other examples of, uh, of, of progress, uh, um, I mean, and in, in that nearly liberal uh, uh, time uh, period, we've, we've seen, of course, a lot of privatizing neo managerial trends. Uh, a country like Chile was probably the most radical example of, uh, of a sudden and, and full privatization of the pension and the healthcare uh, system in the early uh, 1980s under the government of, of Pinochet. Uh, and, but at, in the same decade, at the end of the 1980s, uh, another country of Latin America, Brazil, um, constitutionalized its basic uh, healthcare coverage uh, and providing uh, for many uh, def deprived uh, persons and, and areas. Uh, so we had 
uh, in, in a sense, a huge pr uh, progress in, in healthcare uh, in, in, uh, in this uh, big country of Brazil. It, it was also in Brazil that in the 1990s um, that new conditional cash transfers, uh, transfer programs were started and they later developed uh, more strongly under uh, President Lula da Silva, uh, such as uh, a, a program called uh, Bolsa Familia, which is the idea of uh, inciting families uh, to put their children in school, to vaccinate their children as a kind of condition to receive assist to cash uh, assistance. And this type of, uh, of program, uh, which, overall do not cost so much. Uh, they, they're not very, very costly. Uh, they, have, um, they have spread, this kind of model have spread uh, not only in, in other countries in Latin America, but also uh, in, under different forms in other parts of, uh, of the world. <clears throat> um, okay, so welfare, Welfare states, welfare has, a, has different connotations in different countries. In, in France, in this country, for example, we don't even use the term. Um, uh, we, we use the term état providence, which is uh, almost uh, uh, single handedly uh, used by, 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 by France. And it, it refers to a different kind of, of history. I mean, the term, the very term welfare, probably dates back to the Second World War. It was uh, coined by uh, British Archbishop uh, William Temple, uh, who wrote a book opposing the welfare state and the promise of a better, uh, better times ahead after the war uh, to the warfare state of Nazi Germany. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, the, 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 the concept of état providence dates back to the middle of the 19th century. Um, and it was, um, less positive in, in a way. That was the idea that um, uh, the state had to bear uh, the, uh, the cost of, uh, of uh, solidarity and of, uh, of uh, actually providing for the poor because in, in a way the, the French Revolution had um, um, uh, fragilized most of the, the uh, intermediate or um, uh, associations, the church, and other kinds of actors, of course, they had not disappeared, that, uh, that were um, instrumental also in, into, uh, 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 well, um, providing uh, solidarity and, and uh, redistribution uh, at a time when states still uh, were quite uh, um, weak in terms of, uh, of uh, social policies and social rights. Um, even between Europe and the US, the, the concept of welfare may have slightly different meanings. I mean, to be on welfare in the, in the US, if there are people uh, from the US here today, I don't know, but uh, it's, it's, it does not mean exactly the same, same thing. To be on welfare is to be dependent on, uh, on uh, social assistance. Uh, and sometimes it is being used in uh, political rhetoric uh, as, a, as a weapon also to uh, stigmatize uh, certain categories of people who uh, benefit from, from uh, uh, well, the, the taxes that others uh, pay. I mean, there was a time in the uh, quite uh, uh, strong um, attack on, on, on uh, the welfare state uh, when we, we ref referred, for example, to uh, uh, the welfare queen as a, some, and, and the term had a racial connotation as well, because basically it referred to the fact that you know, uh, black people might benefit more uh, than white people uh, from, from uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of social uh, redistribution. Um, so you have, uh, you have different meanings over time of welfare. In Scandinavia, the countries that I know best, uh, they've been clearly very intimately associated with the notion of a, of a welfare state and to welfare, uh, which is the, the, the term in, in uh, Swedish or uh, other languages, uh, is, is very uh, positive as it, and, and, and means, uh, means uh, even more than just the welfare state and social protection. 
in, in the concept of welfare, you include things like education, good education, uh, universal access to, to, to this kind of goods. Uh, and to some extent, it is uh, also a cultural uh, um, thing that is uh, very much ingrained in the, in the society, um, um, in the Scandinavian societies. So in the class, uh, we try to focus on welfare system and not just states, because of course, historically, there are many different actors that have been involved uh, in, uh, let me just, uh, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, many different actors that, that, that have been involved um, in, uh, in uh, uh, the historical mixes that produce contemporary social systems. The role of charities, uh, Churches, uh, NGOs should not be underestimated, of course. I have uh, an example that I like to, to cite. I don't know if anyone here has, has heard about a, a foundation that is called uh, uh, Tsushi. I don't know, yeah, yeah I have it here uh, on the slide. Well, uh, I'm asking the question for myself because I mean, <laughs> in this kind of setting, we don't expect answers. Uh, uh, right away. I have not heard of it. Uh, well, uh, Eloa, you haven't heard about sushi. <laughs> uh, and it's, sushi uh, was a small charity organization started by a young Taiwanese nun in 1966, but it has accompanied uh, the formidable Buddhist growth in Taiwan to become today one of the largest Buddhist charity and relief uh, operator in the world with more than 10 million members. In 47 countries, TV channels in the US, for example, uh, it operates a significant uh, number of uh, basic healthcare infrastructures uh, also in Taiwan at, at home. Uh, and all this was started by a single nun in uh, Hualien on the west, uh, on the east coast of, of Taiwan. And she's still alive. She's, she's 17 now or something like that. Uh, and, um, and, and it's been financed mostly by the donations of, of, uh, 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 of, of people who were the members of this, uh, this charity. Uh, so th this is only one example of the kind of NGOs, but, but um, that, that play uh, an important role, not only at home, but also in, in other, other uh, um, uh, in other countries, uh, Sushi uh, usually goes where, um, uh, in regions that are affected by earthquakes, uh, hurricanes. I mean, they were uh, in uh, in uh, New Orleans after uh, the hurricane. Uh, um, they they they've uh, been very very active in in the field of uh, relief. So if if uh, if we move to Europe, uh, the Car Caritas Foundation would be another good example, drawing from the. Christian tradition, uh, Caritas uh, operates many uh, social care services in Germany, but also abroad. And um, NGOs of all kinds have become partners in crime for, for um, uh, providing welfare and social assistance pro uh, provision and, and not just in poor countries. Uh, well, the biggest uh, uh, of these foundations that comes to mind is uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's the, largest of all with a budget that uh, surpasses uh, that of many small countries together, thanks to the generous donations of a uh, uh, fellow billionaire, uh, Warren uh, Buffett. Uh, so when Donald Trump suspended the US funding to the WHO during the COVID crisis, uh, well, um, the Gates Foundation did the opposite and they jumped into the fight against the virus and the development of vaccines. Uh, which uh, in turn attracted all kinds of uh, conspirationist uh, theories, as you, as you know, um, uh, around uh, this issue of vaccination. And before that, it had been an essential actor in the fight against uh, AIDS and many infectious diseases uh, uh, in Africa and around the world. So of course, uh, um, um, for, pro for profit private providers are also an intrinsic part of this game, as we can see today with the vaccine rollout and the, the, uh, uh, the need of, a, of a, a private uh, uh, of private companies that can um, 
that can uh, develop and produce a vaccine and distribute it very, very uh, quickly. Private uh, insurance schemes are dominant in the US uh, healthcare system, as I mentioned just a little while ago. They provide um, supplementary coverage in many countries of, and, uh, and they have grown into a considerable uh, market. Um, and, um, and in France, for example, uh, there is a strong development of uh, supplementary uh, uh, insurance uh, schemes and, the and many private actors have actually uh, um, started to, uh, to um, uh, well, are significant actors in, on, this, uh, on this market. So all, all these uh, actors, all these parties, they make up what we can call uh, different welfare mixes, different partnerships with uh, states. Um, they have a load for more or less universal coverage of, uh, of populations, uh, more or less benefits and variations in the historical structures of social reforms that we try to study in this course. And, uh, and we provide, I try to provide some, some historical background um, to, the, to, the, to the extent of my, my, my uh, knowledge. Uh, and and um, uh, so th that refers to, to uh, what S. Ping on the Sun, uh, who is one of the most well-known um, uh, thinker in the field of uh, welfare state typology. The S. Ping on the Sun is a da Danish sociologist. He wrote a book in 1990 that has uh, uh, been uh, widely acclaimed called The Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism. And uh, that book focused mostly on the OECD uh, uh, countries. Um, well, if we move beyond that and uh, three categories of, uh, of welfare capitalism, uh, according to Esping Anderson, we end up with probably many more worlds of welfare capitalism, uh, many more, more uh, uh, norms and, and values with respect to equality, uh, rights, uh, the role of family, family solidarity, because that's, of course, still the primary caregiver and, uh, and provider of uh, uh, redistribution. Uh, so that used to be also the primary care caregiver a long time ago in, in, in Europe, and it's still very important, of course, we should not underestimate the role of, 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 of families. But at a time in the 18th century, when welfare state didn't, states did not exist in, in Europe, some Historians have shown that uh, if there had been no transfers, monetary transfers at all in these societies, I mean, most of the workforce would have been completely, uh, completely uh, unproductive and would have probably died uh, altogether. Um, yeah, so that's um, about the, the, well, that's the, the, the main topics that I tried to, uh, delineate in this, uh, in this course uh, syllabus. But uh, of course, uh, the, one of the big, well, the big change since 2020 is the, the state of uh, pandemic that we uh, currently uh, ex experience. Um, and, uh, and, and that has uh, huge implications for the topic that uh, we are dealing with. And, and last year, I tried to take, it, to take it into account in the course as well, because it was impossible to do otherwise. Um, um, and uh, in, in the remaining time uh, uh, of my, my talk, I will, I will try to give a few indications of how I, I tried to do that. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, difficult um, to do because uh, we are talking about something that is um, uh, taking place right now that is utterly complex. It's uh, very hard to make sense of it. The virus is uh, striking uh, countries, even regions within countries and people at different rates um, and, uh, and uh, uh, across the, the different uh, waves of, of, uh, of this pandemic. Um, I'm not an epidemiologist, so it's not primarily the goal for, for me to try to explain why this is happening so, but I concentrate much more on the kind of response that uh, states and other actors have, uh, have tried to, uh, to, to give. 
but also on the overall impact or likely impact that this uh, pandemic is uh, it, it can possibly have uh, an impact that will uh, be uneven uh, and uh, will have uh, tremendous consequences. This already has tremendous consequences on on not only social welfare but also uh, um, um, uh, many other aspects of our daily life. Um, so the entire world is affected, but not even. One of the big paradox uh, in this uh, story is that advanced welfare states have been apparently more affected at the level of health than many other less well-off countries. But of course, other indirect consequences of the policies of lockdown, of the closing of borders, have been devastating for populations with uh, lower levels of uh, security and uh, often more uh, de dependent on mobility, tourism, and, and trade. Uh, and also, I mean, uh, countries uh, of the South that uh, were apparently not so much affected in the first wave then uh, have been much more uh, impacted uh, since, like, like uh, we see with India right now. Um, and countries like, like Brazil have been, have been all the time. So um, <clears throat> we, we have seen this very clearly in the COVID crisis with the difference between systems where work is mostly informal and where lockdown potentially means losing your primary source of, uh, of uh, income. Um, and the, this is the primary resource for, for your family uh, as well. Uh, and, and probably without any kind of compensation. Um, uh, advanced welfare states, they have been able to provide uh, compensation on top of uh, a better health care, but, uh, but this has a cost. I mean, we, we can see reports of the, the very high cost uh, of, uh, of treating uh, COVID in countries that have private uh, insurance, uh, mostly like in the US. I mean, um, the, the, the cost for families, for individuals may be very, very high compared, uh, compared to what it is in, in other more uh, socialized uh, uh, countries, if I can say so. Um, uh, <clears throat> And not, not, not only were uh, developed welfare states and their populations uh, no longer used or, or prepared maybe for epidemics of this kind, they were also more exposed to the virus because of the combination of aging on the one hand and uh, specific health uh, conditions on the other, such as diabetes, blood, high blood pressure, uh, other kinds of, uh, of conditions that uh, have made uh, uh, people in these countries uh, particularly vulnerable to this uh, virus um, uh, and, and more, more vulnerable than, than expected. Like when we uh, look at uh, uh, some of the rankings or indexes of, of uh, healthcare system performance over the years, for the last 20 years, it's uh, very bewildering to see the the, the, the disparity in those rankings that uh, incorporate many, many different factors. But uh, I mean, since, uh, um, since the uh, WHO um, 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 ranking in 2000, where France was, uh, and Italy were the first, uh, you have had a lot of different rankings uh, that uh, uh, provide a different picture of performance. Uh, the global health, Security index, which is one of the uh, of the last, um, and which is an assessment of global health security capabilities in 195 countries, prepared by the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security uh, and other organizations. Uh, uh, well, it shows uh, interesting things. I mean, countries that were thought to be very, very prepared like the US and different uh, other Western countries like, like uh, Sweden, Denmark. Uh, well, all of these countries, they have not responded evenly um, and they have been uh, sometimes taken uh, by, 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 by surprise um, uh, and, and taken aback by the, the, the magnitude of the, the virus. It was difficult to, uh, pro to organize the, 
the uh, coherent uh, and, and quick response. Uh, as we could see in the US, there was uh, again the, the, the federal structure and the political strife around the, 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 the presidential campaign that was going on at the time that made things very, very difficult. Uh, so basically COVID-19 has been politicized a lot uh, more in this country. Um, and um, um, uh, other countries such as South Korea, Korea may have been more prepared perhaps because they had uh, the experience of uh, the SARS uh, infection, uh, SARS epidemic in the early 2000s. And that, that might, might have been one of the, uh, of the factors that helped South Korea or Taiwan for this uh, same reason uh, to uh, actually better understand, better prepare for, for um, uh, the response uh, to the crisis. But there are of course many other factors that are at play. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and, and, and Sweden, Sweden has, has played an interesting role in this, uh, uh, in this uh, context. I mean, you know that Sweden did not uh, implement any kind of lockdown. They, they uh, had restrictions. They had a, a lot of uh, health-related recommendations by the health agency, but uh, they have achieved a unique uh, uh, position and attracted, attracted a lot of controversies for not, uh, not using this uh, lockdown weapon. And the justification that they have uh, uh, given for that was that, uh, um, well, first, they didn't have all the legal resources to implement a quick lockdown. But, but the, the, the better reason they, they, they had was that it was going to be um, a world pandemic. Um, it was going to spread quickly. It would, uh, we had very little scientific evidence uh, behind lockdown policies and their usefulness. Uh, and it would be difficult for people in lockdown to actually uh, come out and decide how and when, at what pace to come out and, and still try to protect themselves from a second, third or wave. And this has proved true to some extent. I mean, uh, even though there is a, a big gap between uh, uh, the mortality uh, of, uh, of Sweden and neighboring countries like Denmark, Norway that have half the population of Sweden, but that's, uh, you know, Sweden has uh, about five times the mortality of Denmark, 10 times the mortality of, uh, of uh, Norway. But uh, on the other hand, Sweden has a mortality uh, level that is uh, on a par with uh, many other European countries that have used uh, lockdown. So it's uh, quite difficult to make, um, make sense of, of that uh, as well. Uh, and what I tried to do in, in this class is also, uh, uh, well, uh, study the uh, justifications, motivations, and the kind of uh, interplay between different actors uh, that have that can account for uh, different responses at the national uh, level. Um, um, <clears throat> the, the difficult task of coordination of, of agencies, of, uh, of care services, uh, the special roles of, role of hospitals as well. Uh, not all countries in the world are organized around hospital care, but in advanced welfare states, this is the case. And uh, many hospitals have been under unprecedented uh, pressure. So one, one could think that the countries that had more hospital beds were going to be uh, better off. Uh, this is a, just a measure of the number of hospital be beds per uh, thousands of inhabitants, uh, inhabitants 2015. Um, well, um, you, you can see that uh, uh, there's a mixed bag here in uh, countries like, like France that have a quite high uh, number of beds. Uh, they have been, uh, in, they, they have had trouble to, their hospital system has been saturated. So of course, it's not just a matter of hospital beds per se. It's also the kind of beds that were needed, acute uh, beds and uh, people to take care of this, uh, these uh, units. Uh, uh, some countries have managed to reorganize uh, more effectively. I mean, Sweden, which is at the uh, one of the lowest in the in the ranking, has one of the lowest number of beds 
uh, in the, the whole of OECD with uh, 2.4. Um, they we could think that well they had a very big interest to to implement a lockdown because their hospital system would be saturated quickly and that's not really what happened i mean there's not been the same pressure on hospitals in sweden even though it's clearly uh, on the brink and very difficult that then then in in uh, 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 then in, in france germany on the other hand had uh, a lot, a lot more beds. They also had a lot of acute uh, emergency uh, beds, and they seem to be uh, better off, at least uh, in the first uh, wave. So they have, there are um, diverging data here, and it's, it's in, interesting to try to look at that. And uh, and uh, and of course, we can expand that. Uh, we we start to have a lot of literature coming in. Uh, Comparative literature on on the on the crisis on the management of crisis. Uh, when it comes to France, there's one study that is interesting by uh, our colleagues uh, uh, Bergeron and uh, Boaz and Castel that shows to some extent how uh, France, as in its tradition, over centralized or tried to over centralize the response around the presidency. Um, uh, um, not relying on the on the standard procedure on the on the agencies that were public health agency that was supposed to respond to the uh, to the uh, pandemic they, the presidency and the government have created new organizations and that has created to some extent more disorganization um, so it was a bit like that like like if the president and, and the top executive, uh, decided on a strategy and so that because they had decided, then the strategy would be implemented directly in the, in the country. But this is not what happened to the extent that at some point they even had to resort to private uh, consulting agencies like for uh, uh, the vaccine campaign. Um, and, uh, and, and to a large extent, Sweden has done absolutely the opposite. They have, in a way, Go, followed the standard operating procedures, uh, whereby the government is not the primary decision maker in case of a pandemic, uh, although we could think that that should be the case democratically. It's the health agency, and the health agency has a lot of independence, a lot of autonomy to actually um, um, monitor the, the response to the, to the crisis. Um, on a more general plan, and a I'm going to conclude um, soon. We can raise the question of the impact on the neoliberal uh, dogma or um, ideology that seemed to be uh, reigning so far. I mean, the norm to control public debts has uh, exploded with historical level of spending in many uh, countries, especially in the US. Like I think today I read in the news that the Biden administration was asking Congress to authorize a $6.6 .6 trillion budget, uh, which is a historical level. I mean, we have not seen this uh, level of, budgets, of uh, a budget since the Second World War. And that is on top of all the spending, extraordinary spending that took place um, uh, uh, at, at the end of the, uh, under the, the last year of the Trump administration and, the, the, and since Biden uh, came in. Um, it's, it's also about the taxes that are going to be raised to, um, well, finance this kind of, a, uh, of budget, uh, even though uh, countries like the US will uh, continue to run very, very high deficits to, uh, uh, to maintain this uh, amount of spending. And, and the, the forecast is actually to try to keep up with this kind of spending uh, for years to come. Um, uh, in the 2020s. Uh, um, uh, so there are a lot of uh, social spending uh, plans, programs that are uh, involved uh, in this, um, um, in, in, in the, the program that Biden has, uh, the Biden administration has promoted. Uh, and that adds up to, to uh, all the spending that has been done on the tests, vaccines, um, 
but also wage compensation uh, and, and all the spending to boost the economy and to try to uh, limit uh, the, the number, the, the, the level of unemployment. Um, low income countries with high debts will also benefit to some extent from um, a climate that is favorable for renegotiations, possibly cancellations of some debts although that remains to be seen to what extent uh, this will be the case. Uh, however, not all states have the same capacity to or willingness to intervene um, on a par with what the US or other Western countries can be doing. And that will create another round of inequalities with um, the need for international mobilizations. Uh, we can see hints of that with the distribution of uh, vaccines, but it's, it's not clear where we are going, um, uh, you know, the COVAX initiative, which is, is, uh, which is a, a collective initiative at the international level uh, to uh, provide uh, vaccines to uh, 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 low income uh, countries. Uh, this is one of the initiatives that has been uh, uh, working well so far, but uh, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of uh, a long way to go. And, and one of the problem is that, <laughs> If you have like a few countries that manage to vaccinate most of their population, if the rest of the world does not have access to uh, the vaccine, well, it's a good situation for a continuous development of variants and uh, new uh, uh, forms of the virus that might uh, defy the, the current vaccine that we, we have. So uh, there's a collective, um, um, challenge here a little bit resembling a little bit the one that we had at the end of the 19th century when uh, rich people of the bourgeoisie in uh, crowded cities realized that they had an interest to uh, pay taxes and to pay for sewage for good pavement on roads for good water supply because in the end that would be uh, the kind of things that would promote better health and, uh, and limit uh, uh, the number of epidemics that uh, affect everybody. So this is uh, you know, one of the series that a uh, uh, Dutch uh, author, Abraham de Swan, uh, mobilized in, a, in a, an interesting book that I recommend, which is called uh, In Care of the State. Um, uh, okay, so um, public actors, uh, the mobilization of the state, uh, the, 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 come, the return of the state in, is, is something quite, quite uh, striking. The return of nations be with the closing of borders as well. This has huge implications uh, for how we conceive of, uh, um, of uh, uh, future welfare. And with respect to one thing, uh, we can see already now that uh, the rising inequalities due to the COVID crash uh, to the COVID crisis will have a tremendous impact on uh, future immigration waves. We see that at the borders of Spain now, we can see that in other countries. And uh, how are we going to react to this, uh, these new trends, new immigration uh, demands in uh, countries that are known now to, to, to have uh, uh, huge or gr growing uh, uh, right-wing populist parties, and not only them, that are uh, uh, opposed to more immigration and are, that are, uh, uh, I mean, with a growing nationalist uh, feeling that has been to some extent exacerbated by, by, the, by the COVID crisis. So this is uh, one of the biggest uh, challenge that we will be uh, facing. So to finish with, um, uh, I would like to give you a very brief uh, idea of uh, uh, the kind of topics that I deal uh, will that I deal with in 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 this uh, in this class, and I just uh, um, uh, provided uh, um, a little bit of uh, the outline of of uh, last year or well, this year uh, syllabus. Um, 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 and uh, yeah. I'm, would like to, to stress again that um, it's very important in this class to give students the opportunity to work collectively on a topic of their choice in relation to the issue of welfare reform in different countries, in different uh, regions. 
and they should present their work uh, in front of the class. And, and over the year, years, we've had very interesting uh, presentations on many, many uh, subject areas, uh, such as the role of NGO in, in providing healthcare in different uh, regions, policies to reduce uh, uh, obesity in Mexico, experiments of basic income uh, uh, schemes in, in different countries. So uh, this is a, a, a small uh, sample of the kind of topic that we uh, deal with. And uh, well, um, thank you for your attention. Uh, I think I've been talking enough now and I, I open the floor for questions or the discussion. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Johan. So there are already some Questions in the chat, and so, so perhaps we uh, don't hesitate to open your mic if you want to 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 say something. Otherwise, we'll read the questions. We could explain the high and fast growing of pandemic COVID nineteen in the U.S. now by her low health coverage, especially concerning the large population like, like migrants and poor citizens, but what we, see, what we are seeing in poor countries like Africa or Latin, not confirmed that expected India. Well, it's, it's, it's true that we also, we do not have, I mean, a, 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 an equal coverage in the news uh, and uh, of, of, of many, many countries. I mean, even when, uh, India has been hit so sever severely, uh, severely uh, uh, recently. Uh, it hit the news for a few days, and then we don't talk so much ab about it any anymore. But it's uh, still unfolding in India, and it's uh, and uh, the the magnitude of the crisis is is huge. Also for the reasons that I mentioned, that uh, yeah, you don't have the same the same infrastructure. You have a lot of doctors uh, who have been uh, um, who have died, doctors, uh, nurses, and uh, some, some are even uh, uh, mobbed uh, sometime. I was reading in new, the news because, because uh, uh, you cannot provide oxygen to everybody and you have to, uh, to ration uh, the, the, the resources and some, some people are, are mad at, uh, and, and, uh, and in the end, uh, uh, the, the medical personnel, the medical staff can be, uh, uh, can be also targeted directly. Uh, about about the U.S., I mean, you're probably right. There are many factors that can explain. Uh, uh, again, I'm I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not trying to explain so much the difference in um, in uh, uh, um, the initial stages and why uh, countries were affected so differently. Uh, uh, but we can try to do it uh, also by looking at. Uh, the, the response and by looking at, as you say, uh, at the fact that, um, well, there was a prevalence in the US of some of the health conditions like obesity, like um, um, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, and other kinds of uh, factors that facilitate uh, the penetration of the virus. Uh, the, well, prob I mean, probably a lot of people didn't, did not have an adequate uh, healthcare coverage. Uh, people who go to the doctor in um, in in the last uh, resort or go to hospital, well, they, they their uh, health condition uh, is likely to deteriorate, and to they will be more prone to uh, diseases like like that. Of course, so it's uh, it's uh, uh, so the migrant communities uh, and uh, informal uh, workers, uh, illegal workers, they are among among the people who also um, have. Uh, well, uh, the, 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 the who have uh, don't have access to to good uh, healthcare. Uh, this all um, I didn't touch so much on the on the question, the hot issue of uh, discrimination within countries and the fact that some areas with more uh, some more deprived areas. Uh, uh, or uh, areas with more uh, immigrant communities that might be affected more than others. Uh, this is something that also happened in in, uh, in Sweden. There was a debate like 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 that uh, in in Sweden. There, there's a it's um 
it's a tricky debate. Uh, um, in Sweden, uh, migrants or recent migrants were also accused of not respecting as much as the you know, uh, native Swedes, uh, the kind of uh, recommendations that the, um, the health agency was giving. At the same time, we knew that a lot of uh, people employed in the social care services uh, that have been heavily uh, deregulated in Sweden, people working in the nursing homes, in home care, they uh, may be more likely to have migrant origins, to, to have come to Sweden uh, uh, lately, and, uh, and, uh, and they were not as protected um, uh, and, and probably has informed uh, as, as other uh, people, and that's probably also one of the reasons why nursing homes and, and nursing services in Sweden were uh, very, very heavily impacted because the health agency did not uh, give enough resources to uh, uh, workers uh, and, um, and, and, and try to spread the information more even. Um, oops, uh, Another question, right? Uh, the international repartition of vaccines between North and the North and the South. Uh, uh, about human rights. Uh, well, well, there's there's not um, unfortunately there's not a universal right to uh, uh, vaccination. I mean, it's been a problem before uh, COVID. First, we don't have vaccines for every disease. <laughs> vaccines are not 100% effective and they are not evenly distributed. And, and even when we have vaccine in some, uh, some uh, diseases that are quite common in, in Africa and other parts of the world, they have not been able to, to, tame, uh, to tame the disease. I mean, uh, recently we have managed to eradicate uh, or probably eradicate polio. Polio is... Uh, um, well, a disease that took a very long time to eradicate. Um, and uh, uh, so in the case of, uh, of COVID, we've seen like this race uh, for vaccines and, uh, and uh, clearly uh, the countries that, are, that have the most resources that are uh, able to, to pay, that, are, that have a negotiating power uh, with the, the firms. Some, most of the time they are homes to the companies that produce the vaccines. Well, they have uh, better access and we will see, and we already see differences in the provision of vaccines between these uh, developed countries. So for the low income countries, it's gonna be an even uh, more difficult uh, task. And we see also hints of like uh, uh, a cold war of vaccine between the, you know, the Chinese the version and the Russian ones. And they, they, there's a diplomacy of vaccine right now that is very, will be very interesting to, to study, uh, um, I don't know about Ethiopia, for example. Uh, maybe maybe Eloi can, can talk about that. Uh, what kind of vaccine Ethiopia managed to 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 get, if if any, uh, would be the would it be the Chinese? Because we know that in Africa, the Chinese have uh, uh, have uh, been very very present uh, 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 and and try to to buy land and to uh, develop uh, good relations with uh, many different governments. Uh, it seems also the, that so the, the COVAX, I think that uh, Ethiopia is uh, linked also to the COVAX system. Right. Mm -hmm. But you know, there was this uh, reject by uh, the uh, Northern public opinion of the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, with uh, some risks that uh, were uh, uh, taken very seriously, mm. even it's, the level is statistically very low. Mm. And so it seems that a uh, huge amount of AstraZeneca was uh, given mm. generously to uh, African countries, whereas European countries uh, could not uh, use them anymore. Yeah, but at so, the same time, uh, uh, Great Britain, which is uh, the home of, uh, uh, of, of AstraZeneca 
uh, or at least as in <laughs> connections with, with the corporation, they have continued to uh, use it uh, for their population. And uh, so that's also interesting. So uh, countries like Denmark uh, have stopped completely uh, using it, but uh, others are uh, hesitant and but Britain they continue so we will have also scientific studies of the impact of that um, but uh, I mean you're right uh, in what about the COVAX uh, you can have provision of vaccines through these COVAX initiatives but you also have separate bilateral agreements between some countries in Africa in in, uh, well, in, even uh, in Europe you, in, and in you Europe as well Hungary in, the, in Eastern uh, Europe, Russian, uh, Russian. yeah, in Eastern Europe. So uh, even though they're part of the European Union, uh, there's not been a, a, a single coherent, uh, disciplined um, uh, response in terms of, 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 of vaccination. And um, so that's that's a complicated issue. And to what extent it is a human rights issue? Uh, well, it's. Uh, I would like to say. Uh, that is probably a first a public health issue, and that's uh, uh, maybe the fact that uh, without a good distribution of vaccine, we're likely to stay on with this virus for a longer time, that uh, it's likely to mutate again, might be a good incentive to uh, distribute vaccine more evenly. And, and uh, also knowing the fact that you know, uh, big foundations like the Gates, uh, uh, they all also uh, well provide uh, a lot of help uh, to poor uh, countries to try to uh, get an access, secure an access to to vaccines. <clears throat> uh, I don't know. I'll scroll down to see if there are other questions. Uh, we can speak about comorbidities and lifestyle in Sweden and other countries. Uh, well, again, that's uh, more a question for an epidemiologist, uh, but uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting to see like, you know, countries like Japan, uh, we, we've, we've been comparing countries like if they were affected by the virus at the same time, uh, that their geographical position in the world was the same, uh, and that uh, they had the same kind of health 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 care or uh, population. Uh, Japan has a very old pop population, as you know, but it's also a very healthy population in the sense that it has one of the lowest diabetes uh, rate and obesity rate, uh, blood pressure, uh, heart uh, conditions in the world. So that could be one of the reasons why it reacted well in the first wave, except that it's probably not the main reason. It's, it might just be that uh, Japan is a rather remote island with a control of its immigration flux, uh, that uh, there was a, you know, the Diamond Princess uh, ferry ship, cruise ship that uh, was an early warning to some of the countries in East Asia. It was like a pilot test of COVID in miniature. Uh, and, and at the same time now, Japan is, is in a very difficult position because, as you know, they, are, they have to decide on whether or not to, uh, to organize the Olympic Games just two months before it's, it should start. Or, uh, uh, and that's a, a very difficult decision. And behind the, uh, all the negative opinions of the Japanese, uh, uh, we can see that they're probably afraid and, and probably legitimately that uh, this would bring uh, uh, new sources of the virus. And now uh, Japan has uh, started to be more affected than it used to be last year. So it's also still an open question whether uh, uh, it's only comorbidities and lifestyle and uh, nutrition that uh, play a role in this respect. But, um, as for um, Sweden, uh, yeah, it's also like other European countries, an aging population with, uh, yeah, good, healthy life, lifestyle, lifestyle in, in average, but not so much better than than, than France or Italy for that for that matter. So they have a better tradition, or well, a longer tradition of social distanciation. You know, there's uh, this joke that. Uh, uh, basically, the Swedes had to move from one meter to three meter uh, 
and, and that was the main uh, recommendation to stop COVID. <laughs> Um, so there is a question on uh, prevention rather than treatment. So many aspects, lifestyle, traffic, pollution, access to water, influence. Us. How do those public health systems deal with preventing instead of treatment? Well, public health and prevention is certainly a very good uh, point you, you make. I mean, clearly, uh, a, a lot of countries now uh, are uh, well, they will have to think about their pu public health um, preparation much more than uh, they have done so far. But as we can see, uh, there's also a like a reliance on vaccine as being the single uh, solution to uh, to this virus. But what if it uh, persists? What if uh, we have new mutation? Um, it's also very important to think of. Uh, in, in the longer uh, uh, time um, to think about uh, how to make public health more effective. And then we, we have to talk about uh, uh, the way we eat and drink and smoke uh, and, and uh, this kind of, uh, of a public health campaign. Um, well, to some extent, it goes against uh, uh, embedded in private interest. Uh, not exactly the same that uh, sell the vaccines, but. Uh, but uh, it's a way of looking at medicine and medical treatments. But then we, COVID is also inciting us at, at, at looking at the broader picture. And uh, because this is a virus that, well, not only affects old people, it also affects vulnerable people with the kind of uh, health conditions that are very, very uh, prominent, prevalent in uh, Western countries, but not just Western countries. Thank you very, very much, Johan. If there is any additional question also from the audience. Um, yeah, this is a very fascinating uh, lecture, an object of comparison. If uh, we look at it as an object of uh, global studies, we see the, the, the complexity of uh, the difficulty of uh, making comparison between uh, so many different situations with many different uh, factors that are evolving. So it, it, it makes it a fascinating object in terms of uh, social science, because the, the role of science is to make correlations between factors. And we see that making these uh, correlations is, uh, is uh, highly difficult. And, uh, and the predictability of the result is very, very much uh, limited, but it's uh, big challenge. Uh, I was wondering about the, the, the evolution and the reforms of uh, healthcare system uh, in terms of, uh, of history. Uh, what, what is the kind of situation we are facing? I have the impression that since the 18th, 19th century, the healthcare reforms were guided by evolution in technologies of treatment with uh, vaccination with uh, uh, in the 19th century, then penicillin, then chemical pharmacology had a very big impact, I think, in the distribution and organization of uh, healthcare. We, you mentioned also that the evolution of the democratic space the social contract between citizens with uh, public health at being an important uh, part of uh, this uh, way of uh, building uh, uh, citizenship. Uh, we have the impression that the last years before COVID, what was at stake was a kind of uh, World government, better sharing, uh, better organization uh, between NGOs, state, um, that uh, there was, and you mentioned about NGOs and foundations, a kind of a humanitarian transition in embedding the NGOs into the, the local systems and uh, the emergence of a stronger. Uh, welfare systems in, 
in African countries, for, for, for instance, whereas we see that uh, in uh, well-off countries, uh, humanitarization also of uh, social work, uh, NGOs uh, working, uh, that used to be working in, 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 uh, in poor countries, uh, are working more and more in, uh, in developed countries. But what, what kind of, uh, of shift of process are we experiencing? I have the, 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 the impression that it has been very long since the, the, the reforms, the organization of political space, economic space was not dictated by uh, that kind of pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we have to go to the Middle Ages, maybe. Uh, uh, may, uh, maybe not in, in African countries or in countries that are, have actually faced um, epidemic on a more regular basis. Uh, in the last big one that is still, uh, still an epidemic in, in a way is, is HIV. In, in, yes, in, uh, but in terms of reform production of new norms and reforms of system, HIV was, had a big impact, but mm. did it have a big impact in the transformation of uh, social uh, healthcare well, and welfare systems? Well, it, yeah, it certainly had for uh, low-income countries that, are, that were uh, um, uh, disproportionately affected by, by, the, by AIDS and, and, uh, and NGOs played a, a big role and also the question of socializing the production of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, treatments. Uh, uh, was a, a very uh, hot issue for some African countries. And, and uh, we will probably have the same kind of debate. And we, I mean, Biden, uh, to some extent, has opened uh, the gate for uh, the door for a debate like, like this on, on, on trying to make the virus, sorry, to make the, the vaccines uh, more accessible, uh, vaccine production, and to uh, remove the uh, patents on, uh, on some of the vaccine. This, this is... Uh, this is easier to do. Uh, that's one of the critiques that has been made uh, to the US. That it's easier to do for them because uh, they have already started to vaccinate all their population and, uh, uh, and uh, they don't own all the patents, even though. Uh, but, uh, but, but that's, um, that's certainly one of the debates. As, as, uh, when it comes to the main drivers of spending, uh, as you clear, uh, rightly pointed out, uh, uh, clearly the, the, the technology, uh, the innovation in, in, in medical innovation, uh, the rise of uh, hospital structures, uh, costly treatments, all this accounts for a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, 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 the, the spending increase. Uh, but there's also the, as you say, the political driver, which is not reserved to uh, to democracies, because we see it also happening in countries that are authoritarian. I mean, we 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 saw it already uh, in countries like Brazil under the dictatorship in the 1960s. We saw it. Uh, we see it in China. Clearly, there's a very very big um, mobilization for a goal of universal uh, healthcare, which uh, of course will mean different things in uh, regions that are heavily uh, uh, segregated. Uh, I guess you know in uh, western Western China, you will not have the same access, or uh, poor regions in northern China, you will not have the same healthcare access. And there's the the whole question of uh, of, of uh, migration and internal migration in China, because um, internal migrants they don't have uh, the same rights as other citizens, and they are tied to their uh, home region, and if they want to have access to uh, to uh, social care, health care, they have to go back, and that's uh, that's one of the problems. So making it really universal and transferable uh, is, is a very big challenge for a country like China. And this is something a problem that we had early early on earlier on in in the Western countries. I mean, uh, in the 19th century, we also had a, a kind of a residency. Uh, permit uh, because some cities and some localities had better care than mm -hmm. others and they didn't want them to, attract to attract every poor people and yes. every sick people there and they and and they uh, all, so we had this uh, system of residency uh, 
that was dismantled uh, slowly in the 19th, in the 20th century. Uh, but uh, you see what's at stake nowadays, uh, mm -hmm. the, the kind of territorial structure that is right. a big question. It, it, it is very much at stake yeah. also for international migration yes. uh, and, uh, and within the European Union, for example. And uh, uh, what that's something that we should really work on, that the European Union should work on if, if the EU wants to develop into something else than just uh, uh, well, into, into a, a more uh, social uh, policy uh, uh, actor uh, than, than what it is today. Uh, and um, well, I, I, I don't think we're going in this direction right now, or that's, that's, uh, that's unlikely to happen in the years to come. But, uh, um, but we see that already between uh, European citizens and the mobility, the transferability of uh, of pension rights of, uh, across European countries is, is already a challenge and yes. something that uh, we will probably be able to, uh, to achieve one, one day, but uh, there's still a long way to go. Um, and even in countries, uh, federal countries like the US, uh, you don't have the same rights across the whole territory mm -hmm. and you don't have access to the same benefits. Uh, uh, Medicaid, I was talking about it, is, uh, is uh, territorialized. It's, uh, it's uh, organized by, by states mm -hmm. um, and uh, many other benefits. I mean, when you, you, um, you live in California or you live in Texas, uh, you don't have you know, the same rights. And strangely enough, I mean, you can see that uh, um, it's not always the, the, the rich states or the richest states that have been uh, more um, act proactive in providing uh, social benefits, you know, states that are very rich, like Texas or Florida, they have not been in the front, front, front runners. Uh, well, California, yes, but uh, so other states that are uh, less less uh, well off, they say, because of uh, political uh, will and uh, uh, were able to develop uh, better um, benefit structures and and uh, and uh, also social institutions. Um, thank you. Uh, what about the cost of vaccination? The fact that states have to negotiate the price and deliveries to protect their population. Should we think about a way to strengthen public capacity to be more responsive, have better control of treatments? Uh, even in France, for example. Um, yeah, well, this is, this is a huge uh, uh, question. I mean, the cost of vaccination. Yeah, I answered the. Uh, and COVAX is also about, uh, about this, about providing vaccine at a low cost. Um, we will see how the corporations that will make uh, an unprecedented amount of uh, money uh, will uh, react or will be under pressure at some point to uh, liberate the, the patents on some of the vaccines. And we also have to see how long the current vaccines will be efficient, efficient uh, if, um, if we have to move on to other, well, then there, there's the, the, also the treatments that we don't have so many treatments available to, against uh, COVID. Uh, and that's uh, probably also part of, a, of the future uh, a challenge. Um, uh, we had this, you remember this huge debate about uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, that was partly uh, triggered by, by French uh, um, uh, infectiologist uh, Didier Raoult uh, in Marseille. Um, that was uh, for some time. There was a rush for chloroquine in many countries, uh, uh, and, and we saw that you know that might be the miracle treatment. It could have been a miracle treatment because it was it, it cost nothing. I mean, it's it's uh, it's in some of course some some people who were versed into conspirationist theories uh, believe that uh, it was discredited because of that because it costs nothing and it brings no profit. Uh, but uh, well, uh, it's unlikely to be the only reason, <laughs> unfortunately, but uh, we might see treatments uh, um, appear that don't cost a, a lot of money. And um, the vaccines themselves, they, they cost a lot because we have to vaccinate everybody and that's, uh, or almost everybody. And that's uh, also a huge, um, uh, well, I mean, it's never been the case that in such a little time frame we we uh, have or we try to vaccinate some, produce some vaccines. Um, uh, so regulation of the prices certainly. I mean, uh, all the 
the states, they will have a, an incentive uh, to, to do just, just that, to, to negotiate better conditions and, and, and uh, better prices. Uh, the competition between uh, Chinese, uh, Russia, uh, Western companies, that, that will also be part of the game. It's not really my, my field, I'm, I must say, but, um, but it's uh, very interesting to look at how it's going to, to be a game changer. <clears throat> All right, um, any more questions? Um, Still the whole room. Do we have? We have well, uh, technically, we have 20 minutes, but we can end, we can end when, whenever we're running out of, of questions. What we can do in the age of globalization when we can't make our economy growing because the health, you know, health situation, especially COVID-19. Yeah, well, that's the whole, uh, yeah, my question uh, the, uh, of uh, yeah, the, all the side effects that are not really side effects of lockdowns, uh, of uh, closing borders, of uh, um, uh, the, uh, no more tourism, uh, and uh, the reduction in trade in some fields, not every field, because some, some fields have actually been quite, uh, uh, have benefited a, a lot from, for, <laughs> The pharmaceutical industry is just one example, but there are there are others, and there's a, uh, so there are signs of a, uh, quite a lot of um, financial interest uh, in in behind all, all this. Also, there's a lot of speculation on the raw raw materials right now. Uh, um, so uh, we are have not finished. We're not finished with neoliberalism in this sense. But um, uh, the the question about you're asking is is more probably targeted to uh, to, to an economist than, than to to myself. It's uh, it's uh, very difficult to answer that. But there will be um, part of the response will be through uh, uh, national plans that uh, that will uh, try to boost the economy, like the, the huge spending levels that we can see in in uh, in in the U.S. that will have an impact on. The, on the rest of the world, uh, same thing in, in Europe. But then the question would be, what do we do in countries that have been much more affected by job losses, by by the fact by by um, uh, the fact that their job market is much more informal, uh, and uh, and that they are dependent on tourism. So the question of tourism uh, it will be crucial. You know, what kind of tourism do we end up with after or uh, in the years to come, I mean, the, the airplane uh, companies, their forecast is still quite pessimistic. Uh, I mean, about 2020-21, and what about the next years? Uh, uh, um, and uh, so, I mean, I don't have the answers to, to these questions. These are open questions, but there will be, uh, of course, uh, something to do about public debts and cancellations of debts, renegotiations of debts for uh, uh, countries that are, have been more severely affected, and uh, and that's that's part of the mobilization of these countries that they should uh, uh, they should do that. Um, um, very interested in your comparison between health, international ranking. Finally, what system must be chosen to compare uh, to, to better healthcare system according to? Well, it, it's uh, it's a tricky question because the response to to uh, COVID was not just health related. Uh, you, you also had all kinds of fac factors um, of uh, state and territorial organization. Population control, um, sorry? Capacity of population control. Yeah, the, yeah, the capacity of, of, uh, to impose restrictions on, on the, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, on, on your population, your countries like like South Korea, but also New Zealand, and unexpectedly to some extent, they managed to, to do that better. New Zealand, perhaps because they were uh, an island, a remote island in, in the Pacific, but, but uh, um, there's culture as you are referring to uh, as, as well. You know, um, if Sweden uh, could do without a lockdown policy, that was partly because 
First of all, it was uh, they didn't have a state of emergency legislation and they did not want to pass one um, uh, right away. Um, it happened in Denmark and Norway. The politicians managed to actually impose a lockdown. Uh, in Sweden, it didn't happen. And so Sweden was suddenly hailed for respecting uh, freedom and, and liberties. You know, you had all kinds of, all kinds of libertarians, uh, even people from the right who are usually not very much fan of Swiss, uh, Swedish uh, uh, social policies. They started to, to uh, hail Sweden as a, as a new uh, model. But, um, um, you know, of course, uh, and Peter Baldwin that had just come up with uh, an interesting and the first uh, sweeping comparison of the response to the COVID crisis. Uh, it's called Fighting the First Wave. It was published last month. Uh, well, he says that you know, some countries like South Korea, like Taiwan, they managed to impose a lot of restrictions, uh, fines, very heavy fines, uh, prison sentences. Uh, if you did not respect the quarantine, they had uh, also a track system of tracking uh, through telephones. Uh, that was much more effective than everything we tried to implement in uh, Western countries. Um, and, and the experience of SARS uh, in the 2000s was probably uh, very decisive also. In, in, but, but, you know, uh, there are cultural elements. Uh, although what is striking is the level of restrictions that, for example, the French population has actually accepted without so much protest after three or four years of uh, on, ongoing protest, um, the Gilets Jaunes, the, the, the protest against the pension reforms, that was quite striking to see that uh, the French accepted so much uh, restrictions. Uh, so it's not, well, not just about culture, I would say. <laughs> um, do you mean that um, control of the population well, I'm not saying that that's a factor that plays in as as that should be valued uh, as uh, as part of a good healthcare system. I'm just saying that it's uh, certainly effective, and uh, you know uh, the, the the best example is, uh, is 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 China in this respect. In China, they managed to um, uh, to quarantine a city of several millions and then uh, se several regions. Uh, they did it uh, with uh, uh, with all the instruments that that uh, an authoritarian government, like a centralized government like China, the Chinese one, can can use. Uh, you know, there was a Swedish epidemiologist who traveled to China in, during the SARS epidemic in the early 2000s, and he and he testified that you know every 40 kilometers he was stopped and his temperature temperature was scanned, and uh, he was uh, asked for all kinds of information. You know. Um, uh, when you compare uh, with the response that we had in France in terms of controlling uh, controls at, at the airports, you have to remember that France is a hub. Oh, what are we? Is, is it still working? Okay. Uh, France is a hub. It's the first tourist destination in the world. It has uh, many borders with other European countries. And clearly, uh, in the summer of 2020, well, France reopened uh, quite, uh, quite, quite widely its borders uh, to uh, foreign tourists and to uh, domestic tourists. And, and well, it would be difficult to not do that in the future. So it's probably more difficult for France than for South Korea also for this reason. Uh, to, um, and because this to virus respond. is questioning uh, mobility, because I see that among the correlations you make, you, you seem to observe that uh, the correlation with migration, with tourism, it seems to be uh, very relevant because uh, this virus is a virus that uh, is not transmitted by uh, sexuality, but by mobility. And so the, the response of each country has to do with uh, its own mobility system and integration into world mobility, which yeah. uh, makes it fascinating. And that's why the Swedes were partly right in saying that it's difficult to shut down forever. Uh, they, 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 made, they made a bet that the, that the virus would be uh, spreading fast, spreading to the whole world. 
uh, and probably staying on for for some time. And that we where they failed in a way was that they thought that we would not have a vaccine so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, we don't know how effective the vaccine will be at preventing uh, other waves of the virus if the entire world population is not uh, doesn't have access to the vaccine. Um, so it's not uh, yet possible to say that we are done with it and far from it. Uh, and uh, I would be very cautious. And, and but um, yeah, um, uh, the, the first maybe the next tech test will be if this new technology uh, of vaccine uh, uh, can uh, go faster than the virus into transformation and mutation. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, because the vaccine mutation, I'm not a specialist of that, so uh, will. I mean, probably uh, uh, be easy, easier to track uh, and easier to uh, target with uh, uh, just a, a small, small change uh, in, in the vaccine formula. Well, we can expect that uh, the pharmaceutical industry will be able to uh, react uh, as swiftly uh, in the next uh, possible ways. But it's, uh, it's still an open question for you know, also, I mean, we have not talked about all the resistance to the vaccine. I mean, this is something that is uh, clearly happening in, in our own countries. Uh, like uh, the, the vaccine has not yet been made compulsory just because, uh, in my opinion, because we didn't have enough. But uh, once we have enough for the whole population, and then we've seen in France that the Academy of Medicine has, has advised to um, um, the vaccine to be uh, compel made compulsory for the whole population. Uh, so we'll see um, what there has been. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. debate. Over. Yeah, and there's also a debate between you know, should we uh, vaccinate our children uh, who okay transmit the vaccine, but they are very very uh, little affected by by the virus compared to other um, other generations. Or should we uh, target the, va the vaccines to other countries first and to the adult and old age population in other countries? So that's an issue of, um, of immunity. And I, uh, this is not my field again. You are to, uh, at what point, you know, 50, 60, 70, 90 percent, you achieve uh, immunity? Well, uh, uh, so long, as long as, as the, well, the other countries are not uh, vaccinated themselves, then we're not likely to have such a strong immunity, um, uh, especially if the virus continues to mutate. So um, that's um, that's a, a real challenge for, for the future. And in terms of priority, the, the impact on healthcare system, uh, because everything is oriented toward the, the struggle against COVID-19, but still there are so many uh, diseases that kill. And uh, yeah. can you observe uh, in the healthcare reaction, the, the, the capacity of uh, continuing other health activities rather than focusing everything on COVID? Yeah, this is a real dilemma because uh, first, uh, we decided that lockdown were, lockdowns were necessary precisely to prevent the kind of saturation of hospitals that would prevent uh, the treatment of other disease, of other uh, patients. Uh, and at the same time, um, it's, uh, it's uh, really uh, difficult uh, not to focus mostly on, on COVID. And we see that you know, patients that are had uh, new cancer in their early phase. Uh, th some of their treatments were postponed, uh, and we're likely to have higher mortality uh, because of, mm -hmm. of that. Uh, um, in the first wave in France, I mean, most of the private clinics had to almost stop their activity. Um, and uh, what they say is that in some regions that were not so much affected by the virus, they could have continued much more. And, uh, and they were afraid that the next wave was not going to be a COVID wave, but a wave of mortality, a deferred, deferred mortality because of uh, non-treated cancers mm -hmm. and, and other 
kind of disease. We even have the you know the chloroquine uh, uh, problem. Chloroquine is is used for some types of lupus and sometimes of a of a of, of rare disease. And and the patients need, badly needed this kind of uh, treatment and had problems finding it. Uh, so uh, you have you know all kinds of, of side effects. But it's one of the things is that um, for the last decades in the Western countries, mostly we had a, um, like a kind of norm that it was important to reduce the number of beds in hospitals. Mm -hmm. And now this uh, kind of pandemic, well, points in the other direction. Uh, it shows that we need good public, pu public service in, in the healthcare sector. Uh, it also points in, uh, to, to, the, to the need to reform how we we take care of the old uh, people in our countries because you um, the catastrophe that we had in some of the nursing homes in France, Sweden, England, you know, in in Britain, for example, because to avoid saturation of uh, hospitals in the first wave, what they did is that they transferred all patients from hospitals to nursing homes without testing them. So they basically send them uh, with COVID and that was uh, you know, a big factor. Uh, Amnesty International has actually issued a report uh, and Dominic uh, Cummings who was uh, one of the advisors to uh, Boris Johnson testified a couple of days ago in parliament about just that. And, and in Sweden, uh, that was uh, different, but we didn't have enough space, enough beds, as I said, in in hospitals and to avoid saturation, well, we did not transfer at all some of the people who were too old and they stayed and they died in the nursing homes because they couldn't have access to, a, so they, there was a kind of priority that was made and it was made in many countries without over, uh, openly saying it. Uh, but, but then now that we gonna have, you know, commissions of inquiry and uh, this kind of things, we'll know more that more scientific studies or, or what has, has taken, taken place. So it's, it, it, it was bad, of course, it's, it's going to made us reflect on how to organize the, mm -hmm. the hospital and the healthcare system in the, in the years to come, hopefully. Are we going to learn from, from our mistakes? That's the, that's the problem. If the virus stays on, I guess we will learn some things, but uh, the next epidemic might be very different. And might require very different resources. And, uh, we we are happy that it was not Ebola that we got. Okay, shall we stop here? I think. Uh, I think uh, yeah. we have come to an end. Well, you. I don't know how many of you are were behind the screen, but yeah, uh, so <laughs> there, there is a kind of interaction, but uh, with but, a limited uh, understanding of yeah. our side on, on the, the size of the audience. But uh, but we hope you had a good time, and uh, <laughs> and that the audience on YouTube will have a good time, which is a different kind of audience. Right. Okay. Uh, they, they can write some comments, and mm -hmm. uh, so we will see. We are also experiencing uh, new new practices uh, in the field of uh, academy teaching. Uh, the, the, the last uh, months is of uh, yeah. lockdown and uh, e-teaching uh, have been... Uh, Zooming. Uh, <laughs> we will see That's the impact true. of it. All right, take care. It's... Um, good evening.